Good evening. Welcome to our Ash Wednesday service. Ashes are a sign of mourning in the Bible. Job sat among the ashes when he was stricken. When Tamar was attacked by Amnon, she put ashes on her head and tore the long robe which she wore. And she laid her hand on her head and went away crying aloud as she went. In Esther, when Mordecai and the Jews learn of the order for their persecution, they put on sackcloth and ashes. In Jonah, when the king of Nineveh is told to repent, he arose from his throne, removed his robe, and covered himself with sackcloth and ashes. The use of ashes, which can also sometimes be translated as dust, may have several origins. Ashes appear frequently in the Hebrew scriptures as the result of the temple sacrifice. They were plentiful and symbolized what was left after an offering was burnt up. Ashes and dust are trodden under the feet, so they're understood to be lowly and despised. Ashes are symbolic of death and loss, as we are reminded in Genesis that we are dust, and to dust we all shall return. As those who gather today to remember that we too are dust, and ashes, let us begin now in worship. Please join me in the call to worship. The Lord God formed humans from the dust of the ground. God breathed into our nostrils the breath of life, and we became living beings, made from the dust, but filled with the Spirit. We gather for worship and community. And if we do not worship, the dust itself will rise up in praise. In this moment, we are living in conscious proclaiming God's goodness to all creation. And when we return to dust and bones, our stories will testify to love and justice. So, breathe in the Holy Spirit, knowing you are alive for a moment in time. We breathe and know these things to be true. Let us worship our God, the giver of life, are Wednesday's Ashes. It's number 2138 in the faith we sing or on the screens.
giver of life and comfort in death, you are the source of every mineral and molecule forming our bodies. You are the source of every spark and sugar energizing our personalities. And you are the source of the divine breath that brought us to life in the first place. Today, we gather to remember our humanity, our brevity, and our limits. Though our dreams and egos are grand, though your unique love for us is immense, our lives are also a speck on the beach, a chuckle in time, a comma in your novel. We gather on Ash Wednesday to remember, we are dust and to dust we shall return. May the truth of our humanity and the power of your infinite love draw us closer to you. Amen. And now, a reading from Joel. This is in the second chapter, verses 1 and 2, 12 through 17. Blow the horn in Zion. Give a shout on my holy mountain. Let all the people of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming. It is near, a day of darkness and no light, a day of clouds and thick darkness, like blackness spread out upon the mountains, a great and powerful army comes. Unlike any that has ever come before them or will come after them in centuries ahead. Yet even now, says the Lord, return to me with all your hearts, with fasting, with weeping, and with sorrow. Tear your hearts and not your clothing. Return to the Lord your God, for he is merciful and compassionate, very patient, full of faithful love, and ready to forgive. Who knows whether he will have a change of heart and leave a blessing behind him, a grain of offering and a drink offering for the Lord your God? Blow the horn in Zion. Demand a fast. Request a special assembly. Gather the people. Prepare a holy meeting. Assemble the elders. Gather the children, even the nursing infants. Let the groom leave his room and the bride her chamber. Between the porch and the altar, let the priests, the Lord's ministers, weep. Let them say, Have mercy, Lord, on your people, and don't make your inheritance a disgrace, an example of failure among the nations. Why should they say among the peoples, Where is their God? Please join me in singing our next hymn, Come and Fill Our Hearts. It's 2157 in the faith we sing. gather together as a family of faith, it is our great joy and honor and responsibility to pray with and for one another. And tonight, as we pray these prayers of the people, I will offer up some folks, and then I will say, Lord, in your mercy, 
and your response is, hear our prayer. Today we gather in prayer for those who are suffering oppression, loss, and pain in this world. Also knowing God calls us to be the hands and feet of Christ wherever we go. Holy God, your people are suffering. We lift them up in our community to ask for your mercy and to commit ourselves to the tangible work of compassion. We pray for those living without basic necessities of adequate food, water, shelter, clean air, or community. May we partner with you to meet the needs of your precious children. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for those living with physical ailments, conditions, and diseases that cause frustration, pain, and suffering. We especially pray for those without access to adequate medical care. May we partner with you to bring healing to those in pain or discomfort. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for those living with mental illness or disordered thinking. We especially pray for children and adolescents who are feeling hopeless. May we partner with you to bring healing and to create healing spaces for those in anguish. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for those oppressed, abused, isolated, marginalized, silenced, threatened, or unsafe in their homeland. We pray for refugees, immigrants, and all who are forced to flee the horrors of home. May we partner with you to be a sanctuary to those who suffer violence and oppression. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You are a good God, and you desire that all humanity thrive. May your spirit inspire us to bring relief to ourselves, our communities, and our neighbors around the world. And now with the boldness of forgiven and reconciled children of you, we are bold to pray as Jesus taught his disciples, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Now please join me in singing Bless the Lord, number 2013, in the faith we sing. I invite you to pray with me and for me. Holy and merciful God, on this night we come to remember who we are, what we are, whose we are, and who we may yet be. 
And so, God, be with us in this time as your scripture is read and your word proclaimed, that we might hear a word from you through or in spite of all that's said or done in Christ's name. Amen. To begin a reading from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 6, beginning in verse 1. Let us listen together for a word from God. Be careful that you don't practice your religion in front of people to draw their attention. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. Whenever you give to the poor, don't blow your trumpet, as the hypocrites do, in the synagogues and in the streets, so that they might get praise from people. I assure you, that's the only reward they'll get. But when you give to the poor, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that you may give to the poor in secret. Your Father, who sees what you do in secret, will reward you. When you pray, don't be like the hypocrites. They love to pray, standing in the synagogues and on the street corners, so that people will see them. I assure you, that's the only reward they'll get. But when you pray, go to your room, shut the door, and pray to your Father who is present in that secret place. Your Father who sees what you do in secret will reward you. When you pray, don't pour out a flood of empty words as the Gentiles do. They think that by saying many words, they'll be heard. Don't be like them because your Father knows what you need before you ask. Pray like this. Our Father who's in heaven, Uphold the holiness of your name. Bring in your kingdom so that your will is done on earth as it's done in heaven. Give us the bread we need for today. Forgive us for the ways that we've wronged you, just as we also forgive those who've wronged us. And don't lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. If you forgive others their sins, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you don't forgive others... Neither will your father forgive your sins. And when you fast, don't put on a sad face like the hypocrites. They distort their faces so people will know they are fasting. Fasting, I assure you, they have received their reward. When you fast, brush your hair and wash your face. Then you won't look like you're fasting to people, but only your father who is present in that secret place. And your father who sees in secret will reward you. Stop collecting treasures for your own benefit on earth, where moth and rust eat them, and where the thieves break in and steal them. Instead, collect treasures for yourselves in heaven, where moth and rust don't eat them, and where thieves can't break in and steal them. Because where your heart is, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Okay, i start with a confession. It's Lent. Confession is the theme. So I'm right on theme, right? Ready? This is my confession. Ash Wednesday used to be my least favorite church day. Not so long ago, I was younger than I am now, and the last thing I wanted to hear, particularly the year that it fell on my birthday, was to hear that I'm dust and to dust I shall return. I desperately want to believe that I am so much more than dust, that we are so much more than dust, because dust is the stuff that I find on my knickknacks because none of the adults in my house are very good at keeping house. Dust is the stuff that makes me sneeze when I finally get around to cleaning all those knickknacks and shelves and books. Dust, at its best, is a little annoying, and at its worst, well, it condemns me as a lousy housekeeper. Ash Wednesday marks the beginning of Lent, a 40-day span crossed by six Sundays. This week, I was listening to my favorite morning radio show on the way in, and they were talking about what they were all going to give up for Lent, right? If you talk with folks who observe Lent, usually the first question out of the box is, so what are you giving up for Lent? And one of the morning DJs was saying that um, he was either going to give up alcohol or fast food because his wife had pointed out that he was growing his dad bod and he wanted to fix it. 
And I'll tell you, that conversation made me a little sad because the disciplines we take up for Lent are meant to help us give our hearts back to God. Lent is not a time for dieting. You might decide you want to eat healthier, but that's not what we're offering to God. The text from Matthew reminds us that if we pray or fast or give charity out of our pride to show other people how good we are, we've already received our reward. And those actions, while they're good, aren't what God wants from us. As I've wrestled with this church day, what I've come to find is that, yes, Ash Wednesday is about remembering that we are mortal. But just because our days on earth are a limited time offer doesn't mean that they are not important. And on this day of ashes, we're invited to figure out exactly where our heart is. Have you, often, have you ever stopped to figure out or think about where you've put your heart? I'm talking about metaphorically, right? Your literal heart is here, right, right here. Um, yours is in your chest, mine is in mine. But, but metaphorically, where have you put your heart? It's not something I do very often. I'm usually so busy trying to do things, to accomplish things, to be able to scratch, please, just something off of that to-do list that I've been building that I forget to take time to pray and reflect. Like a Janis Joplin song, I invite lots of things to take another little piece of my heart, and I've discovered, much to my shame and dismay, that I've given little pieces of my heart to a lot of things that are good, but they're not God. Our reading from Joel describes a terrible tragedy that has struck the people, a plague of locusts who have come in like a great darkness. Can you imagine so many bugs that they blot out the sun and they ate everything, leaving nothing for the people to eat or to offer to God? And yet, in that reading, there's no particular sin named. We know that this life on earth is not as it is in heaven. Our, we make bad choices, our ancestors make bad choices, and sometimes bad things just happen. Even if we're doing our human best, we know that we all sin and fall short of the glory of God. We're not perfect. We're human. In light of this, the prophet calls the people to return to God with all your hearts, with fasting, with weeping, and with sorrow. Tear your hearts and not your clothing. Return to the Lord your God, for he's merciful and compassionate, very patient, full of faithful love, and ready to forgive whatever it was. The word that we read here as return is often translated as repent. And I don't know about much more, if there's a much more churchy word than repent. I mean, maybe narthex. I don't know. But repent is right up there. The word that's translated as repent is the Hebrew word shuv, which literally means to turn around, to change one's direction, to stop going off on our own ways, and to start walking toward God. It's like a holy U-turn. In this understanding, our heart is the place of thought and commitment. This is a different way that the ancients understood it, right? Because we would think that uh, thought and commitment probably live up in our minds. But in the ancient world, it was your heart that thought and committed. It wasn't just a place for fluffy feelings that can vanish like vapor. The prophet asks the people then and the people now to tear our hearts, to break them open, to discover the places that we've committed ourselves and decide where our priorities are. Are our hearts chasing fame and fortune and everything that goes with it so that even if it looks like we're doing the right things like going to church and giving to charity, our heart isn't really in it. It doesn't work if we're not if we're doing the right things out of ought instead of love 
alongside the people that Joel is addressing, God asks us to break our hearts, not just to put ashes on our faces. God asks us to approach with sincerity, not just duty or ritual. God asks that we genuinely cry out for mercy rather than just repeating some words that we'll forget as soon as they cross our lips. God wants the whole person, each of us individually, right? It's a little hokey pokey, but you only put your whole self in. And God also wants the whole people, the entire nation that Joel is addressing. That's why a bunch of people who usually don't get invited to big shindigs, the assemblies, are explicitly invited. The very young, even nursing infants, mama and baby, come to the assembly. The very old who might usually be stuck at home, they are invited. The newlyweds on their honeymoon, take a break, come to the assembly. No one and no reason is a good enough excuse for God to miss this opportunity. God comes not just for a personal relationship with each of us, but for a communal relationship, shaping us into the body of Christ for the world. And that's why we read this at the beginning of Lent. The time of the Christian year when we remember our unpredictable, untamable, wildly loving God. Ash Wednesday begins the season where we anticipate God's unexpected, even offensive appearance, not in glory, but in shame, not in power, but in weakness, not to triumph for us, but to suffer with us and even on account of us. So Lent's not a time for frivolous disciplines. There's plenty of other times for that. This season is for examining our hearts and experiencing the best broken heart ever, breaking them wide open so that God can reign within us such that God's kingdom might come on earth as it is in heaven. I'm confident that God forgives our sins. I also wonder what that costs God. I confess for myself that sometimes I treat God like a celestial vending machine. I put my sins in and forgiveness comes out. And that doesn't feel good or right to see it as only a transaction. I wonder at the nature of my, of our relationship with God, if I were to treat my spouse like I treat my God, would I be worthy of his love? If I gave away pieces of my heart, my affection, my commitment to someone other than my spouse, could I call myself faithful? And how does that hurt the beloved? In the same way, if my heart wanders from God and I commit it to other things, how have I hurt the one who loves me even better than my spouse beyond any human measure? And yet... And yet, our God bears it. We often think about our forgiveness bought so dearly on Good Friday as we remember Jesus' betrayal, abandonment, and crucifixion. But I wonder, I wonder, beloved of God, how often we continue to drive new nails into our Savior because our hearts go wandering. So right here, right now, as we reflect on the things that turn us from God, the places where our hearts are prone to linger that might be good, but they're not God, I invite us to begin our journey to the cross, prepared to meet our God who always defies expectations. We might be caught off balance. We might be surprised. And yet we'll find that our best and only hope in this life and in the life to come is there, is in God. Our God who recklessly pours out God's own life, constraining the fullness of God into the human life of Jesus and then showing us exactly what love looks like, despite pain, despite betrayal, even despite death, so that we might have strength for today and bright hope for tomorrow. Only out of our heart's commitment to our wild and generous God 
might we find the courage to turn, to repent, to shuv, and to start again. For God's sake, I hope we break our hearts to find the fullness of life that God intends. He'll be the best broken heart ever, I promise. Glory to God. Amen. Beloved of God, the early Christians observed with great devotion the days of our Lord's passion and resurrection, and it became the custom of the church that before the Easter celebration, there should be a 40-day season of spiritual preparation. During this season, converts to the faith were prepared for holy baptism. It was also a time when persons who had committed serious sins and had separated themselves from the church, community of faith of the church were reconciled by repenting and receiving forgiveness. By these acts, they were restored to participation in the life of the church. In this way, the whole congregation was reminded of the mercy and forgiveness proclaimed in the gospel of Jesus Christ and the need we all have to renew our faith. And so I invite you, out of this long line of tradition and on behalf of our church, to observe a holy Lent by self-examination and repentance, by prayer, fasting, and self-denial, and by reading and meditating on God's holy word, to make a right beginning of repentance and as a mark of our mortal nature, may we humble ourselves before our God. Our ancestors in faith used ashes as a sign of repentance, a symbol of the uncertainty and fragility of human life. Like them, we've tasted the ashes of hopelessness. We've walked through the ashes of our own loss and pain. We've stood knee deep in the ashes of our brokenness. And so I invite you to pray with me over these ashes. The prayer that we will offer is found in your worship guide. Let us pray together. God of our lives, out of the dust of creation, you have formed us and given us life. May these ashes not only be a sign of our repentance and death, but reminders that by your gift of grace in Jesus Christ, our Redeemer, we are granted life forever with you. Amen. So ashes are a little different this year. I don't know about you, but um, whenever I've imposed ashes, uh, some of them fall into your eyes, and some of them fall and make you sneeze, and some of them get on your lips, and it's just not fun. So in support of a campus ministry in Iowa who provides these, um, this is um, vegan and cruelty-free and all the good things, but it is more like a chapstick that has the ashes in it so that they will stick well. Okay, so as you come forward, if you have hair across your forehead, just move that out of the way for me, and I will make the sign of the cross on your forehead and remind you that you are love, and to love you shall return. Also, because these are in support of a campus ministry, we have regular and we have glitter. <laughs> because there's a lot of fun theological research out there that suggests the dust that we come from is the same dust of stars. We are beautiful. We are stardust in God breath. And so as you come forward, I will ask you, regular or glitter? So I'm excited to celebrate this time with you. I trust that you know how to move yourselves toward the front. And so as you are ready, I invite you to come and receive the ashes.
please stand as you're able and join me as we sing our closing hymn, Lord, Who Throughout These 40 Days. It's number 269 in your hymnal or on the screens. all for so much for being with us this night. I know Wednesday night church is not always a thing that is the strong suit for United Methodist, but you made it. Well done. On Sunday, we'll begin our Lenten series on This Is My Body, um, ways of thinking about how Jesus lived in his body and invites us to live in our bodies as the body of Christ, and so I'm looking forward to that. There's a whole Sunday celebrating how Jesus took naps, and I'm very, very excited to observe that day. But at this, in this moment, to receive this blessing that comes from a poem by Jan Richardson called Blessing the Dust. Hear these words, beloved. All these days, we feel like dust, like dirt, like what's left over after the fire. It feels as if all we would have to do is turn our faces toward the wind and be scattered or swept away by the smallest breath as insubstantial. Did we forget what the Holy One can do with dust? This is the day we freely say, we are scorched. This is the hour we are marked by what has made it through the burning. This is the moment we ask for the blessing that lives within the ancient ashes, that makes its home inside the soil of the sacred earth. And so let us be marked not for sorrow, and let us be marked not for shame. Let us be marked not for false humility or for thinking we are less than we are. But... Let us be marked for claiming what God can do within the dust, within the dirt, within the stuff of which the world is made, and the stars that blaze in our bones, and the galaxies that spiral inside the smudge that we wear. Go, beloved, for you are sent in Christ's name. And the church said, Amen. Amen.